the church, you are at the training center. And this has been one amazing year. And I thought, okay, how could we just like talk about all the great things that God has done? And I thought, you know what? This would be cool. What if we could have each one of you come and sit down with some of our ministry leaders from all the different campuses and say, what is it that they thought was so amazing about what God did this past year? They're all inside the training center right now. So like, hey, come on, let's head on in. Okay, um, we're talking to people about great things God's done this yeah. last year. Yeah. What, what's the great stuff? Yeah, we were just talking about? about just some of the stories at our campuses. Uh, in Remerton, Damien uh, baptized his daughter Zaley. They're a military family, started getting, coming to the church, got involved in February leading the hospitality team in this Easter. Baptism. God transformed family. That's so true. I, I was just thinking that, you know, 273 people were baptized in 2016. That's not even counting Easter. Easter was incredible this year. In fact, there was a woman at our campus. Uh, our early childhood team did such a great job with her child that in the gathering she was able to stay the whole time. And as a result, she decided to get baptized. It was spontaneous, wasn't planning on it. I just love what God is up to in all of our campuses. Yeah, we had uh, over 90 baptisms in the last 12 months at North Mason, 70 of which spontaneous. Uh, one story, though, my little brother two weekends ago made the decision to make Christ King and get baptized. Yeah. And my heart is just Come on. So cool. yeah. That's awesome. Hey, two yeah. weeks ago, Easter, we had our largest gathering ever in Tacoma, 190 people. Come on. Come on. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Cool. Swim launched at Easter. We had 85 people. Man, it's so cool. exciting to see people just show up from Swim. Swim. Yes. Yeah. Swim. <laughs> Love it. So one of my friends, you know her, uh, yeah. Ginger's been praying for her husband for over 20 years. And uh, he says yes to Jesus after we launch. He gets baptized in the Hood Canal. And this year, uh, in our Friday night gathering, he is the cook for our Friday night gatherings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. One of my highlights for last year was Outrageous Christmas. Yeah. New Lifers are so generous. We had a New Lifer who uh, heard of a person in the community. It was a single woman who was going in for surgery. She couldn't pay her rent, had no firewood for heat. In one weekend, New Lifers brought her a truckload of wood and had a cash offering of $1,500 in one gathering to make sure she was taken care of. That's awesome. I mean, what's the great things got to the students? Yeah, one of the things we're celebrating is uh, we have had over 700 students come to summer camp this last year, and 250 adult volunteers volunteered a whole week to serve those students. Wow. Here's what I love. It keeps happening, not just in the summer, but we did Freedom February this year, and our students had a tagline, do what we love to stop what we hate, and they just said, we want to help end human trafficking, and so in February, they led our church to raise over $37,000 <laughs> to help in team and traffic. That's so crazy. Middle schoolers so cool. and high schoolers across Kids Up and Beyond is cool. Yeah. The, Ryan, the cool thing I've seen about with that is just even in this room right here, the big windows, is that this this building is we're thinking arrows out. And uh, I did some quick math this week, and we're reaching um, over 27 middle schools and high schools in our areas. How cool is that? Just like mm -hmm. every middle school and high school knows that you knew I think that's a person there. That's so cool. Every week, all across our New Life Youth campuses, over 120 volunteers serve. Mm -hmm. Talk about people becoming the church, people getting their hands dirty, getting in, yeah. and serving these students. It's yeah. amazing. So, what are you guys doing? Yeah, so here's something that we're so excited for in kids that we're celebrating. Last year, we had four kids camps, over 1,500 kids, and over 1,000 people serving. Oh my goodness. And get this, get this, every child went home with a Bible. That's 1,500 families equipped with God's Word. How cool would it be if every single child, ages kindergarten uh, to fifth grade, once they have graduated kids and gone into middle school, that they would have memorized over 100 Bible verses. Pray for our kids leaders. I mean, all our campuses, they have a really big job. We believe that these kids um, really are going to grow up and change. The, that's, that's how this world's going to be changed. That's how our nation's going to be changed. And so pray for our kids. And thank you for everybody. Can we give up right now for everybody who serves with kids every single week? That's so, so, yeah. so thank cool. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. All right, from your perspective, what are some yeah. of the great things God's doing in community? Yeah, so this last February, we did the second annual Night to Shine from. We had 368 guests with special needs come and we celebrated them. We had over 650 volunteers that came together to let them know that Jesus loves them, that they have value and meaning. And if you were there, it felt like heaven on earth. It was amazing. Yeah, you know, if you've been to any New Life campus in the past months, you've probably heard about people becoming the church. And so in this series, we had about 300 group leaders step forward and say, man, I'm interested. I want to lead a group at my house at a coffee shop anywhere and so we're excited what groups launch this coming week 
and uh, we're expecting you know, a couple thousand people to be plugged into groups this group season. I hear there's a great book that's going to help people with their groups. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk more about that later. <laughs> what do you got? Uh, we're just talking about how, as a church, we're committed to come alongside marriages and families. And through classes, seminars, and groups, we've had couple after couple have their marriage refueled, refreshed, and healed by the power of the gospel. And with the training center coming, I'm just excited to see what Jesus does next as marriages and families get healed. Just be excited. Debbie! Good morning, Wes. Hey, what's up? What are you up to? Oh, by the way, does everyone know Debbie's our training center director? You've got to be pumped. Wes, I'm so pumped. Have you seen this place? It's amazing. And God is already at work doing amazing things in people's lives. What's some of the stuff that happens here day to day? you got to check it out. On Monday nights, okay. we have life classes. Okay. Tuesday, theology. Wednesday, <laughs> youth. Thursday, women and worship group. Friday, events. Okay. Lots of different events. Yeah. Hey, hang out in the lobby um, and then have any, everybody can, after the state of church thing, just come out and we'll talk to you, okay? Yes, please. Yeah. I love people. I That's love really people. Good. Ministry leaders, like great things Scott's doing. But minute, what's it like having a place to rehearse? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, your home all of a sudden. <laughs> but hey, you guys are working on some kind of project. Like, what's that? Wow, yeah, we're working on a recording project. We're going to release it May 19th. It's okay. called People Becoming the Church, I think. Okay. Hey, if you guys need, like, I, I don't play a lot of instruments, but... <laughs> we do you need, need a, a viola. You can go with your standard triangle. I, I want to play triangle. <laughs> how, how are we doing financially? Like, how'd that go last year? Well, I think we had a great year. I mean, one thing, we're in the training center, on time, in budget, and Sarah campuses did really well, didn't they? They really did. They were in the block by over $32,000. Huh? Okay, so uh, what, what do you attribute that to? Like, why? I think it's two things. I think it's generous people and good stewardship. Okay. You know, in, in yeah. fact, 500 new families gave for the very first time this last year. That's big. That's yeah. big. That's hey, big. Hey, Jeff, tell them about Push Pay. Push, you know, a lot of new lifers want to give online, right? They want to have yeah, that convenience. Sure. They want to give online. And so we've actually launched the most secure, most convenient giving platform out there called Push Pay. And in fact, if, if anybody has questions, they can come see me or Jen in the lobby and, cool. and we'll help you out. Good. Yeah. I would say that one of the most exciting things for me, last year we did two things that stick out in my mind. One, we put six wells in Burkina Faso, Africa, as a, as a New Life team. That's incredible. The second thing, I mean, we gave a guy a car at Christmas. Car. On the way home from the hospital with his wife, preemie baby, they got rear-ended. He had no uninsured motorist insurance, didn't have a way to get to work. New Lifer stepped in and said, we're going to give him a car. I actually gave him driving lessons, which <laughs> I'm still alive. It's still good. But I just think it's so fun. New Lifers are so generous in our community and around the world. Yeah, so here's the deal. When you give, we give. And we're able to really impact our world and community. So yep. thank you a ton. By the way, be praying. There's people behind the scenes making stuff happen um, that really help out the, every campus. And this network team, they're helping everybody. So thank you guys for what you're doing. Okay, when you see one of them in the lobby, seriously go, good job, guys. <laughs> okay. right. God's done great things this last year. And God's going to continue to do great things. And the great things that God wants to do, it starts in our hearts. So allow God to do a great work in your heart because when God works a great work in you, he does a great work through you. And this next year, we want to see the gospel explode in our communities. Can't wait. Hey, so what are you reading? Well, it's not that important, but uh, it is Little Women. Little women? Yeah. Hey, do you know what happens? No, what happens? Beth dies. No. <laughs> Say it isn't so. Brandon, what are you reading? Well, I happen to be reading a book called People Becoming the Church. Have you guys ever heard oh, of that book? Wow. Come on. How many have a copy? Office. Do you have a copy Put your hand yet? up. You got All a copy. Right. All right. All right. Yeah, I've been What's reading. What's like one of your parts that you just love out of that book? I love, this is, this is one of my favorite lines. It says, sharing the gospel is the privilege of every follower of Jesus. It's not telling people how to live. It's telling people what you have found and what you've experienced. Wow, that good? that's good. That's do you good. have a favorite spot? Well, I do. I mean, just right off at the beginning, the introduction, there's this question. What if God wasn't asking us to go to church? He was asking us to become the church. And I just think that's such a paradigm shift for us to go. It's not about just showing up here. It's about us being sent out to be the church everywhere we go. That's right. It's that's so right. Good. It's the journey. We've been talking about chapters today. Yeah. So many chapters in our lives. And I was just going to say, by the way, if you want to pick up your copy of the book, Brandon and I would be happy to sign it today. Yes, so, absolutely. So we'd be happy to. We'll be out in the lobby signing No one's really asked us to, but Actually, we Actually, last gathering, someone did. Um, so anyhow, I've already signed one. 
<laughs> Sorry, Wes. Um, but anyhow, so, so good. But Did you yeah. tell him you were Wes? No, I oh. signed my name. Co-author. <laughs> okay. um, no, it's our story, isn't it? This is our story. We had to live it out first, and now we have the opportunity to be able to share it. And some of you, you're just coming in. You get to be a part of this incredible story. And there are these chapters. So what was chapter one? Chapter one for New Life, what did that look chapter like? Chapter one was the beginning. It started at Gateway Fellowship, Christ Memorial at the time, and there was a few people that were just beginning to believe. I remember it was 2002, and Wes came to me. He, he and I had been youth pastors for a long time. He says, hey, I'm starting this church, and I'm working with adults now. And I remember thinking, I, I don't think that's going to go well. <laughs> and... Uh, there's a family that um, I got to know, and they started at New Life on week two, chapter one. Um, it's Debbie and Jeff Lindgren, and they have two kids, Kristen and Brian Lindgren. Brian Ling Lindgren now re leads the Central Kitsap campus, or uh, not the campus, actually. I think West still does that, um, <laughs> uh, but leads their youth ministry. And uh, I remember Brian because um, both Debbie and Jeff said, hey, we're coming to New Life because we want a church um, that has, like, a great youth program, and I'd just been hired as the youth pastor at the time, and um, what I found out is that Brian Lindgren was really squirrely. He was the kid that was too cool for my youth group. I couldn't get him to come. I'd go to coffee with him, spend time with him, wouldn't, wouldn't come, went off to college. His sister, on the other hand, totally wonderful, Kristen, got to know her right away. They got baptized. I think there's a picture of her being baptized um, with Wes and I and just such an awesome moment in her life. And uh, uh, it was probably about four years later, Brian had gone to college. I found him trying to write a kid's book. I think he wrote a kid's book in a coffee shop on Bainbridge Island. I'm like, man, you got to come be a part of New Life. I asked him, Mark asked him, we asked him again, we asked him again. He finally got plugged in, and now he's just been doing an incredible job uh, leading that youth program. And it's just fun to watch the different families that started at New Life that have been with us for over a decade as they've grown up, that were kids that are now leaders in our movement. Yeah, incredible chapter, and that's what I love about every novel you read. There's chapters, and within that chapter, there's a story, and it seems to be leading somewhere else. And chapter two was kind of an unexpected move to Silverdale. So people from Paulsbo didn't even know the freeway went past the mall exit. And it was one more, Newberry Hill. And that's where New Life ended up, was that Clahalia Secondary School gathering there on Sunday nights. And there was a couple that got invited. In fact, the husband and wife, Chris and Rhonda, at separate times that week, they had friends invite them to New Life. And they said, well, where is it? And someone told Chris, well, it's at Clahalia. And Chris said, really? That's where I teach English. He was an English teacher at, at Clahalia, and it's so cool to think that the Seidels got invited to That's be a part awesome of picture. New Life in Chapter 2, and even so, to be able to raise their kids. And here's what they said. They said they loved New Life because the messages connected with where they were at in life and gave them an opportunity to talk to their friends about Jesus as well. And it's pretty exciting to see that Rachel's part of our kids' team here at New Life, and just to see what God has done in their family in Chapter 2. In chapter 3, Wes was dreaming with a team of people about planting campuses all over Kitsap County. You see, when you believe that the church is people and not buildings, you realize we could gather anywhere. And it was at that time, I think it was 2005, you and I started hanging out in meetings together. And someone said, hey, Jonathan, you should plant a church in South Kitsap. And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. And I thought to myself, if Jonathan doesn't die doing this, I might try and do it. Early adapters. Early adapters. Mushroom eaters. And Jonathan, Jonathan and a team of people from South gathered and began to plant this church. It was incredible to watch it grow. Uh, a couple years later, we planted Bainbridge, and then we planted North Mason, then we planted uh, Bremer, or, uh, North Kitsap, then we planted Bremerton. And God just began to grow more and more people as God was beginning to work. And it'd be interesting to see how many yeah, people... just in this room alone, like how many of you are part of a campus that has launched out of CK from other campuses? So you don't currently go to CK, you go to another campus. Stick up your hand. Look around. Isn't, Isn't this cool amazing? to see how it's just grown over the peninsula? Mm -hmm. It's so incredible. Well, we have a couple of our friends that want to tell the story of Chapter 3. Take a look at this video. Hi, we're Steve and Connie Bohannon. And what brought us to New Life South is... 
Jonathan Stone called us about 12 years ago. We were in between churches and asked if we would help start a New Life Church in Port Orchard. It was my chance to tell Jonathan that way back when he was 16 years old and we were in a missions group together, that I told God, if this guy ever is called to start a church, I want to be a part of it. And I remember how nervous Jonathan was. And he goes, um, I think there's only going to be 25 people here. And I think we're going to be related to each and every one of them. Well, that first day we had 75 people. And it was a great, wonderful launch into where we are today. Hi, we are Karn and Brian Girardi. And what drew us to New Life is that when we were coming to the campus at Klahowia, we just really enjoyed that the messages were just so real and relatable that we felt like we could share them with anybody. And one of the main things that has kept us at New Life is it is the perfect place for every age. I mean, in our family, we have four generations going now from my dad to my daughter Karn, my son-in-law Brian, five granddaughters and two other daughters, and it's just a great place for family. The campuses don't just grow, but they multiply. And I just think that's so great that people can have a church in their specific community. It's so much fun to see what happens when people become the church in all of our communities. There's so many stories to celebrate. It's interesting, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and now chapter four. One thing that's never changed is that, changed is that from the very beginning of New Life, there's always been a dream of a training center, of being the kind of church that sends people out. And to talk about chapter four, we want to invite to the stage Wes Davis. Let's give him Please a Please give him a welcome. Right on. So, um, good, how's everyone doing tonight? Isn't this fun? Um, this is, if you come to one of our gatherings or things, there's always a lot of energy, but this is kind of like family time. And uh, we, it's a chance for us to come together and go, okay, God, you know, where are you leading us? And so um, in, your, in your program, did you pull out where it says chapter four? Would everyone just pull that out and pray like crazy that my voice holds up? <laughs> my goodness. What a weekend, huh? Friday night, some of us were here and we had a opportunity to uh, thank Gateway Fellowship for launching New Life, and I was on a stage with Tom Dushman, and we had a great moment together. Wasn't that great for our church? It's a kingdom moment. It was so powerful. And uh, of course, uh, Saturday and Sunday, there's been, there will have been eight gatherings in this building this weekend. Isn't that crazy? I think it's crazy. All right. <clears throat> so the, the way we set it up is like this is, uh, th this right here is our vision for the next three years, okay? That's, you know, I, I used to think we could do everything in like 60 days, and then the staff around me were like, just stop, okay? Because you're killing us, okay? And so I'm, I'm learning that, that, that sometimes, it, you know, plan some things out a little longer and give it, people some space and let people like sleep and breathe and drink water. And so um, we divided this up in three sections, okay? And um, Here's kind of what I'm hoping is this is, say the church has kind of been one of those times where our family comes together and God speaks to individuals and they end up doing things they weren't planning on when they came. And I'm praying that tonight God's going to speak to you and um, you're going to be like, wow, I, wouldn't, I didn't really expect that. Um, so we divided this up in three sections and each of them is kind of like focused financially about like, the first ones that we call our baseline goals, and this is what we've budgeted for, and so we like we can do these with good stewardship and people just doing what has been done in the past. Um, it's hard to believe, but right now, one year um, with our on the mission giving, our training center gifts, and events that we do in and out is about six and a half million dollars. I remember our first year was fifty thousand. There were weeks, honestly, when someone when people would go on vacation, you were like, "Don't go." <laughs> That's like kind of funny, but then like serious too, and it kind of hurts. <laughs> and so um, we put it in the, and then you can see like um, it, it, as God provides, we're going to be able to do some more things. So we did baseline goal, momentum goal, and then our crazy idea goal. And so, so would you, everyone just kind of read the first one with me, and, and this is what we say, okay, baseline goals, here's some things we're doing. The first one, let's read it together. Open the train. Done. Check it off. 
By the way, leadership lesson from Wes, every, I, make, I make lists every week. The first one's always something I've already done. <laughs> Seriously, I'm like, wake up. Done! <laughs> All right, two, let's read it together. Get every campus thriving. Listen to me. Okay, it, it, you know, this weekend, and we know it's grand opening weekend, and we, we actually did two Saturday night gatherings in this space. We're in the heart of Silverdale. Um, God's really provided in amazing ways. But... Um, you know, this, the, last night and then this morning, this place has been filled with so many people. Last weekend was our soft launch. We had a 1,000 more people than we had on a normal Sunday. And we had more today. So I just, I, I know that that's like God's going to fill this space. Uh, but here's the thing. If this grows and our campuses don't, something's wrong, right? We want every campus to grow and thrive, don't we? Every campus. And for every campus to grow, listen to me, for every campus to grow, every Christian needs to grow. And so what, what it means is this, is I really believe this. Take it down to a really basic level. Is God asking you to do something that you haven't done before or you haven't done in a while? Does that make sense? Like, like okay, uh, one of the ways to grow, I can't think of a way to grow unless you get involved. Seriously. I mean, like... I can't think of a way that you grow without getting involved. Can you imagine Jesus like, hey, guys, I want you to grow and change the world, but you don't even have to follow me. You don't even have to do anything. No, he's, he, he actually calls people to involvement. And so this whole church is people becoming church about people getting involved. And so as you get involved, you grow. But notice this. When we first get involved, we tend to get involved with areas that we're comfortable in. Right? That's the way I am. But if you really want to grow, you know what I'm talking about. God asks you to get involved in areas that you're not comfortable in. Where is God going to speak to you about being involved? Now, some of you are like, I would never lead a group. Guess what God might be saying to you? Time to lead a group. It might be a group that you didn't expect. I had somebody say to me, hey, um, I, 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 my schedule is crazy, but, you know, I want to lead a group in my family because, you know, a lot of families will come to church, but they don't have church in their home. They never talk about God outside of this space or outside of the campus they're at. And so um, that's a great group. Um, my, my wife, for years, I mean, I kind of like people, you know what I'm saying? Like, if I get, like, really tired, I'm like, we should get with people because people energize me. But I wear my wife out. She's the opposite of me. And, you know, um, so all the time I'm like, you know, like, let's be in this group, let's be in this. I have told her so many times about groups that she should lead, and she is so disobedient. <laughs> she, she came to me, she came to me a few months back, a couple of months ago, and she said, you know what? God told me about a group he wants me to lead. God wants me to lead a group for teachers. I thought, wow, maybe instead of telling other people what I think they should do, let's just let God tell them. I'm learning. Don't judge me. Um, so I'm asking this question. If every new lifer will take a step to involvement somewhere beyond your comfort zone, let me tell you, this church is going to grow, every campus is going to grow, and every Christian's going to grow. I believe it. Because I've seen it. So listen, I don't have to tell you. Your campus pastor doesn't have to tell you. God's going to tell you. And would you just be open? Would everyone just do that? Be open to God. Now, it might be leading one of these groups. But we also want to reach families. It might be working with the kids. And you know what? I find this. You will grow a ton by trying to teach kids the Bible. Because kids will say stuff like, that doesn't even make sense. And you'll be like, I know, but I don't. Can I come back? <laughs> Three, say it with me. Invest in compassion partners. People come and they say, hey, Wes, why doesn't the church do blank? And I love it when my wife's there. She'll whisper in my ear. She's saying, because we're already doing it. And, you know, a lot of times people don't realize our strategy might be different than what they're used to. Our number one strategy is, this, is to activate people on a personal level to love people like Jesus loves them. You know, people go, well, the church should. Who's the church? You know, if you handed somebody a Bible, they read it, and you said, okay, what's a church? What are the chances that they would say a building, a business, or an institution? Zero. Zip. None. They would think it's people. 
So when we talk about the church should, we talk about, hey, maybe God's calling us to love people. Now we can do it together. So everybody being compassionate, we love our neighbor, we love people. And then it, strategically what we do is this. We partner with great organizations. So our strategy isn't, how does New Life start a food bank? Raise your hand if there's a food bank in your community. Let's fill all those, don't you think? We don't start organizations to compete with the organizations in our community. You go, well, I don't know if they're a Christian organization. Well, let's send Christians in there. <laughs> we'll be like, you know, undercover. <laughs> so cool. We, you know, some of you know in Central Kitsap, we have every third grader that wants it that is below reading level has a mentor from our church. Two years ago, or last year, our superintendent of schools came to New Life to thank us and say this, data's in, the hard data. Turns out kids learn to read by reading. And when adults show that they're interested, it changes the story that I go from I'm dumb, I'm not a good reader, I can't make a difference to I'm pretty good and I'm pretty special and people care about me. He came and he said, our data says this. When kids come in, here's the baseline. Here's where we thought we'd be. By the end of the year, we thought they'd be here. Guess what? Your kids, 71% higher. Come on. That's not us blowing our own horn. That's the community. The community saying, hey, thank you. This year, I'm not kidding. They came to us and said, we, can we throw a party for you guys? And we're like, of course. <laughs> hey, listen, we just believe if we will partner with great organizations, love our community, get involved, I have one person say, hey, Wes, when, you know, we go in and listen to kids read. When are we going to tell them about Jesus? And I'm like, are you kidding? We're gonna, Jesus is saying, listen, teach them to read. I'll tell them about me. I'm telling you, if we will love people in Jesus' name, they'll talk to each other. All right, four. Say it with me. Launch to new camp. They've launched and are launching. Squim and Tacoma. We got to keep having babies, you guys. <laughs> Middleton can't be the only one having twins. <laughs> Would you welcome with me to the platform our leads from Squim in Tacoma, Kyle Sanborn and David Light. Come on up here, you guys. <laughs> so cool. He's got his whole family. That's cool. That's cool. We got, okay, so we got Kyle and your wife Angelique was here last gathering. And David, it looks like you and Megan got your boys here. So cool. Love it. Hey, what's in your hand? Oh, I see you. I see you. Still remember the kids' camp wrap? <laughs> Discipleship, guys. Okay. Um, Kyle, um, what's got up to in Tacoma? Yeah, so we, we launched in, uh, in October, and... Our first week, a uh, gal came to the gathering. She went home. Her family said, so what'd you think? And she said, I'm mad. I said, why are you mad? Because I liked it and I didn't want to. <laughs> and so then fast forward, that was October. This morning, her kids were serving, her and her husband were serving, and his parents were serving. Three generations on the mission in Tacoma. It was really awesome. That's so cool. That's so cool. Uh, David, what's got up to in Squim? Well, you know, when you go to launch a campus, location, location, location is important. And so when we walked into the middle school, I met this woman named Connie. And she was bright, full of smiles. And she, she's like, hey, do you want me to show you around the campus? I was like, yeah. She started showing me all around. She said, now, what are you here for? I said, we're going to be launching a church. She goes, well, I'm looking for a church. I said, well, great. Today, when we had our, our gathering this morning, uh, she filled a whole table full of people that she has brought on the mission with her. So we're super excited. Well, I am, I'm going to ask you to stand because we are going to commission these uh, leaders to preach the gospel. So would you stand up? Let's and all stand. I'm a stand right. guy, sorry. I'm and safe. Dan, you're here to commission and pray for him. Absolutely. You know... Something we like to say at New Life is that no one does the mission alone. Am I right? No one does the mission alone. Imagine how it would feel to be in Squim and Tacoma, leading the charge, launching something new. Do you think that the enemy occasionally is there trying to whisper to them, you're alone? You're in this alone. I think you might fail. So we have an opportunity as the people of God tonight to send them to Tacoma and Squim. We're going to make sure tonight 
as we pray for them and as we commission them, that they know they are sent and they are not alone. Am I right? Yes. So, let us commission you. They have their Bibles open or their phones open. In the very last chapter of Matthew, as Jesus is about to ascend, he gets his disciples together and he shares this with them. He commissions them. And we are tonight being commissioned by Jesus and we're commissioning them together. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Tacoma, the Squim Valley, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples, and there will be new disciples, to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. Be sure of this. I am with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. New life, let's pray over them together. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. You're sending these wonderful people to Tacoma and to Squim. Jesus, you have gone ahead of them already. You are opening doors. You are finding people of peace for them to meet. Jesus, you are up to something magnificent in these communities. And we, together, all of us, the people of God, in this moment, we commission them in your name and we send them in your name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you, guys. So cool. So two, two new campuses and praying, God, where, where, where next? Where next? Um, so as there's momentum, we go, okay, well, what do we want to do next? Okay. Five. Read it with me. Launch young adults. There needs to be some cool stuff to do for young adults other than Seattle. And let me tell you, young adults are like the secret sauce in a church. And a lot of times, you know, most, most churches don't have them. They're not, young adults are, le you know that, they're leaving churches. But here's what's interesting is this. Millennials, young adults, they tend to crave a, a number of things. One of them is this, is they want, they want people their own age that are, that, that they want to have friends their own age that are heading the same direction. They want to make a difference in the world. And you know what's interesting? Three, they want mentors. Isn't that interesting? I, I kind of grew up in a different generation. I call us uh, latchkey kids. Like our parents like keys in the back, figure it out, we're at work. And that's how we had to make it work. Well, um, the, this generation, millennials, are looking for mentors. So here's how we're going to do young adults. We're going to do it together as one church. They'll drive, trust me. They'll figure out, okay. We're going to do a one big rally once a month here, boom, for all young adults all over. And then um, uh, every week there will be groups for every young adult to have peers their age, and then we're going to be connecting them to mentors. So many of you are going to be called to be mentors. You want to work with a young adult, and you just feel called. Jesus is saying it to you right now, and you're going to mentor a young adult and help them be, reach their full potential in Christ. Doesn't that sound exciting? All right, next one. Read it with me. Training center space in each community. All right, close your eyes. Can you picture a training center like this in your community? I can. How awesome would that be? You can open it, by the way. How, some of you guys never even closed your eyes. You peeked the entire time. Um, listen, I don't know the size or the scope. You know your community, so you'll know the right size of the facility, and you'll know what it looks like and where it needs to be. It needs to not be in the middle of nowhere. It needs to be in the heart. We want to be in the heart of what's going on. But you know what's interesting is this, is, is um, Someone from South Kitsap last year gave us some land and said, hey, sell it and use the money. We'd like, and we'd love to see something like a training center in South Kitsap. And so um, a couple weeks ago, we signed around on the property. It hasn't closed yet, so pray for that. It hasn't closed. But it should yield or net somewhere around uh, $50,000, $60,000. And that's a great seed, isn't it, to get going, isn't it? And um, I was just thinking about that. And I was just wondering. I'm just asking this question. I wonder, are there people out there, and like you have something and it's sitting there, and honestly, you, like, you've worked hard, you've been a great steward, but you could take that, like, would you, if you could, take that and turn it into a training center in your community, would you do it? This place happened because a ton of people sacrificed from all different campuses. 
And, and we needed to come up with, in 60 days, a million dollars. You guys know that? To make this happen, we needed a million dollars in 60 days, and God provided. Provided $1.4 million, and then a 1.1 over three years. I'm just so grateful about that. You know what's interesting? I saw a number of those people here this morning. And, and when they walked around, do you think they were walking around going, nah, not worth it? <laughs> Bummer. You know, you know, honestly, people I've never seen get emotional were in tears. As they saw the crowds of people and young families and teenagers and seniors and everybody who was coming in and this place was packed and people were worshiping. And that worship team, are you kidding me? Oh, my goodness. Like, uh, you know, what Mother's Day weekend, we're going to do here a comedy night because cr- people need to know that Christians can laugh and love God, okay? And some of you guys don't know that, so you need to come, okay? So that's a Friday night, and then the next Friday night, we're going to do a worship concert with that team. Oh, my goodness. They've got it. Okay. So, so they're walking around. I see them in tears, and they're like, and people are just going, totally worth it. So I don't know how God's going to provide it. I just know this. He has a cattle on a thousand hills. Seven, read it with me. The Daniel Project, help me out, training kids to be leaders. The short of it is this, after school kids program, this is in the incubation period where we are really kind of like the conceptual period where we're putting this together. But I grew up with a grandma, and some of you know that my grandma changed my life. Both my parents had to work to make things work. My grandma would be there. She'd cut up her apples, stack the quarters. She knew how to motivate me. She said, before you can have that, and before you can play basketball, I want you to go over your scriptures. And I learned the Bible from my grandma. What if we just did that with kids? And not just that. You know, um, you know, in the Bible, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were world changers. Why? I don't believe it started when they were teenagers. I believe it started when they were kids. What if we started with, like, first graders? And after school, at our training centers, there was a place to come to. And you could, one, learn the Bible. Two, character traits. Three, learn communication. What if our kids were great speakers? Huh? Okay, and not only that, what if we taught organizational leadership skills? I've been talking to people who do tutoring, and I say, okay, what's the biggest problem? And you know what they say? 90% of all kids' problems in school can be solved with one thing. And I'm like, what's the one thing? I want to know the one thing. They said, take a kid's backpack and dump it out. Some of you are like, take my backpack and dump it out. What if we taught kids organizational leadership skills and raised up world changers for this nation? Well, it's possible. But, you know, maybe God's speaking to some of you to be involved in on that, okay? Okay, so it's going to start small. That's a dream. It'll spread. But that's something that's on here. Okay, number eight. Okay, say it with me. The intent. Okay, I'm more excited about this one than all the other ones. This is the one I'm most excited about. And I'm more excited about this one than this building. I've been dreaming about this. Okay, it's called the intensives, and here's how it works, okay? This is something that you would do, okay? Um, think of it, it's split up in four quarters, okay? They're 10 weeks, it's intense discipleship, Jesus-centered, action-based, you do it together, okay? So you would sign up, and there's no way you'd be able to do it in a year. It might take like three, okay? So here's the deal. Think of it like, okay, this, there's a person, I don't know. Let's just, uh, let's call the person, do we have a picture of a person? What do let's call this person you, Okay, this is you, okay? And so you're like, okay, I want to do something. And you know that the world has big needs. And you know that someday this world's going to need you at your full potential. But you know this, you're a little bit afraid, right? Because you're like, oh, I don't think I can do this by myself. So you go to somebody else and you're like, hey. And they're like, hi. And you're like, have you heard of the intensives? And they're like, of course. And you're like, we should do this together. And they say, I'm all in. So you talk to more of your friends because you're a new lifer, because that's what you guys do, and then they all sign up for the intensive. Okay, think of the intensive like this. You have 40 to 70 people in a class, but, but everybody's in groups of five, because it's basketball, okay? <laughs> okay, and, 
And, and, and then every week, here's the thing, it's 10 weeks, you get an action book. And in the action book, there's 10 experiences. So every week when you come together, there's training and great teaching from experts in this area, like prayer. But then you don't just learn about prayer, you actually have five experiences that week about doing prayer. Prayer garden, prayer mountain, prayer closet, all kinds of prayer walk. And so you're going to be doing stuff and learning. We think you're going to grow the closest relationship with God that you've ever had. This whole first quarter is about you and God. And you know what? How many Christians honestly love God, go to their church, don't have a connection to God, don't have personal time with God, and actually wish they were closer to God? Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches, that's where it starts. We think that in these 10 weeks, God's going to tell you something. He's going to give you a crazy idea. He's going to be like, here's what I want you to do. And you'll be feeling the power of the Holy Spirit because you feel close to God. But here's the thing, you know this, the idea God gives you is going to be bigger than you, so you're going to need to build your relationships. That's the second quarter. So the first one's you and God, the second one is you and others. And so in these 10 weeks, the first one, you get a spiritual life coach. Second one, you have a relationship coach. And this is what's going to happen. We're going to help you have the deepest, best friendships that you've ever had your whole life. Because you build friendship on the mission together. It's called communitas. It is the bond of friendship that is forged to a shared ordeal. You know what I'm talking about? I went with my grandpa to his Air Force reunions. And you know what was interesting? He hadn't seen them in decades sometimes. They saw each other and they were a band of brothers. That's the church. Those were the disciples. God doesn't want us to just be acquaintances. He wants us to be family. He wants us to be a team. He wants us to be a fist. My, Coach K talks about it. Some teams are five fingers, but we need to be a fist. God wants us to be a fist. Now, it could mean this. It means might mean forgiving somebody. It might be getting over a hurt. Anybody here ever have somebody hurt you? Okay, a bunch of you are liars. Okay, we've got to get this, you guys. Because some of you, this is what happens. God tells you what he wants you to do. You try to do it by yourself, and you fail, and you give up. And now you don't want to do it again you got to have the relational strength. Jesus didn't ask one person, hey, me and you, and then I'm going to leave, and it's up to you. He built a team. Okay? You and God, you and others. The third one's called your gifts. So now all of a sudden, there's a team of people that are going to want to do something, but we got to figure out what are you good at, what are you not good at, what is somebody else good at, and that happens in these 10 weeks. And now you have a talent coach. And you're going to learn all about spiritual gifts, but you're also going to try things. And you're going to get out there and do things. And you know what, I love it. At the end of this, I think you're going to have an idea of not just your crazy idea, but a strategy and a plan and what everybody does. And we're going to open it up for you to go to what I'm going to call the shark tank. And you're going to share what you want to do. And you know what, people that love Jesus are going to have an opportunity to help make that better and if they want to invest in it. Can you imagine the Spirit of God filled with people doing crazy ideas in teams with Jesus? This is going to be amazing. Okay, the fourth quarter it leads is called your mission. Now, this is where you get to practice it. How many know that the first time you go to do something and you practice it, it doesn't really always work out real well? You gotta test it out. That's why Jesus would send out the disciples, like, hey, go out, and then they got to come back and he'd go out, and then they came back and he's like, now I'm leaving, go out. <laughs> That fourth quarter, you're going to be working out your crazy ideas, learning from it, making it better. And what's going to happen is this, at the end of the fourth quarter, you're going to graduate. And we're going to hold a graduation here at the training center. You're going to invite all your friends. You're going to walk. We get to celebrate you. And we're going to have class speakers. And you're going to share, this is what God's put on my heart. Here's my crazy idea. Here's our team. Here's what we're doing. And then you're going to tell your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers. People would never go to church. They're listening to somebody share good news. And it's not a pastor preaching. It's people becoming the church. You say, well, that would never happen with me. Exactly. That's why people don't think it's God. <laughs> we, we either believe in the people becoming the church or we don't. Every church has great pastors who can preach. But where are the people becoming the church? That's a movement. That's the power. That's the energy. That's what's going to take. I'm excited about that one. I believe in you guys. I believe in you guys. I believe in the power working through you. I believe the dreams that God's going to give you. When the Spirit came upon people with sons and daughters, young and old, men and women, they had dreams, they had visions. That same spirit lives in us. It is the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And people are doing this. It's happening amongst us. Some of you are living out with your friends, crazy ideas. But you know what? We need others. 
You're going to be like a crazy idea coach. Wouldn't that be awesome? Nine. <laughs> Say it with me. Summer programming for youth and kids. Okay. Do we have an awesome kids camp? Yes. Do we have awesome youth camp? <laughs> I serve just so I can go. Raise your hand if you've ever volunteered at kids camp or youth camp. Raise your hand. Wow. My goal is this, is that next year every hand gets raised. I don't know how. Maybe it's a day. Maybe it's, I don't know how. I just wish. I mean, it's a dream. It's just a dream. I just know this. Something special happens in our hearts when we work with kids. You say, well, I'm just not really called to kids. I don't really like kids. Oh, so you just love people 13 and older? That's weird. What if we had all summer cool stuff for kids and youth? Every day of the week. Okay, listen. Okay, if you're a parent, and maybe it's a single parent home, don't, I, don't, I don't know the situation, but you know, and you work. Everybody at the home that's an adult works, and the kids are now home for summer break. You're like, what do we do with them? And if you're a parent that's at home, you're thinking, what do we do with them? Okay, so we're working on this. It might take, I, we're not ready this summer. I hope next summer, but we're working towards it, okay? Next one, develop property on Randall Way. Okay, all right, we apparently need more parking here. Okay, got it. People are like, Pastor, we need more parking. Got it. We'll tell people they can't come. Okay. <laughs> no, we got we to do it. But we, but praise God that people gave and are continuing to give so we are able to keep that property. Huh, we need to thank the Lord for that. That was awesome. It's across the street. We were able to keep the, okay, anyways. All right, next one. School of ministry, okay? All right, we already have a university um, partnership with Northwest University for people to do higher ed. I want to continue and grow on that. Um, we uh, would love to have, can you imagine just having a school of worship? Can you imagine theological training? I love the, Theology Tuesdays is going to take off because people want it. And so, and then the last one is this, launch training centers around the world. Listen to me. Every book we sell, half, okay, five paid for the book, five goes to launch a training center somewhere else. We keep none of it. And um, actually, there was someone out there today, they went and bought a book for every one of their coworkers. Um, we are going to, at the end of this series, people who come to church, surprise some friends by giving them money to do a training center where they live. Here's one of my friends. His name is Chaitanya. Chaitanya is a pastor of a church called Capstone in Hyderabad, India. And uh, Hyderabad is the Bellevue Kirkland of India. And, you know, the first time I met him was like six, seven years ago. And he showed up. And seriously, he just came to Klahal. Yeah, he showed up and he was like, I am Indian and I heard about you. And so here I am. And I, I, I gave him Dan Sirdal's address. <laughs> that is true. Anyway, okay. Um, we have become friends. He's friends of our church. He preached at our church. I come to learn he is uh, one of the, I just think, world changers in India one of the young pastors that's just up and coming and getting invited to the United States now quite a bit. Um, he's going to be here in July. And they um, have a dream to do a training center in Hyderabad. And we're going to give him money to get started on that while they're here. Isn't that awesome? This right here is Adams. And Adams is from Nigeria. At, that's not Adams. That's Wes, okay? But you're like, wow, he's from Nigeria. Okay, that's Adam. At, okay, so Dave Raley is one of our elders. He was invited to the Luzon Congress. Um, what an honor. Isn't that cool that one of our elders got invited there? We got great people in the church. And so he was invited there, and he, he was in a small group with Adams. And so he's talking with them. Adams leads a ministry that launches churches all over. And uh, he said to Adams, like, what's your dream? And Adam says, I would like to start, a, and he described a training center. They call it an empowerment center, but a training center in Nigeria to, to help launch more campuses and to continue this great work. And so Adams, we, we're working on the visa issue, um, so, but um, we are going to, a part of the money is going to help Adams launch a training center. Wouldn't it be, uh, we're going to really work hard to get him here. Wouldn't that be awesome? And then, because um, we're doing it all over the world, this is uh, Jeffrey Portman all the way from Piala. 
And so uh, Jeffrey and Joanne are dear friends. Uh, he apprenticed here. We're one of the churches that helped launch their church. By the way, last uh, Easter, they had over 700 people. And so, and they just, they just are able to get a new facility. It just appraised for a million dollars more than what they bought for it. And so he's really excited. But they need money to get going on it and do a training center there. And so we're going to have him here and we're going to bless him as well. Listen, we have decided we're going to be a church that doesn't just say, um, you know, support our ministries. We're going to be generous and support others. And so I'm just so excited about these next three years. And here's what I'm praying is this, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart because in order for this mission to grow, you have to grow.